Inflation is still higher than we want it to be, and it continues to affect us all. Companies have put up prices as their expenses have risen, and workers are pushing for higher wages to cope with the cost of living. For the next three episodes, we've got something special for you on offer. The ECB Podcast Summer School. In this mini-series, we'll take a deep dive into the nature of the inflation that we're currently seeing, we'll take a closer look at the main way of fighting it, our key interest rates, and we'll unpack the role of banks in passing on the impact of our monetary policy to companies, to you and to me. So, welcome to the ECB Podcast Summer School, helping you understand what's going on in the economy and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm very happy to have ECB Chief Economist and Professor Philip R. Lane here in the studio to break this all down for us. Philip, welcome back to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, inflation has been above our target for almost two years. We know what's caused this, a complex combination of factors that include pandemic-related supply chain bottlenecks, Russia's war in Ukraine and the the related energy crisis, and a post-pandemic rebound in demand. And we've spoken about this several times on this podcast. Now, we get data on inflation every month. The latest set of figures showed the inflation rate falling to the lowest figure since the beginning of 2022, which is certainly good news. But all in all, it still seems uncertain to many people where prices are going to go. Philip, what is making it trickier to understand how inflation will develop? Well, I think you've answered your own question in in your introduction. Just look back at these years. I joined the European Central Bank in summer 2019. And uh, early 2020, we had the start of the pandemic. And the pandemic... I should emphasize, really can be thought of as having uh, two phases. One, uh, we all remember those horrible months of lockdown. So in those in in that period, if you like, uh, people were at home. There was very little economic activity. And in the initial months of the pandemic, in fact, there was downward pressure on inflation because the economy was so inactive. Then, uh, fantastically, the uh, vaccines were invented and really from um, 2021 onwards, there was a a big uh, resurgence uh, in in the world economy. And that's a lot of dislocation. Put the world economy into sleep, then reactivate it. There's a lot of uh, dislocation, a bit like uh, what happened previously with the uh, World War One and World War Two. The dislocation of that did lead, uh, at the end of those episodes, to uh, an inflationary surge. You can't just flip the switch, basically. Right. So so that, that, if you like, uh, uh, is ongoing. Uh, Although the the pandemic is behind us from a public health point of view, uh, realistically, it does take time uh, to settle down. And then, as you mentioned, uh, you know, especially here in Europe, uh, f- from February 2022 onwards, uh, after Russia's unjustified invasion of Ukraine, that added a, a spectacular uh, surge in energy prices. Now, that has reversed the amazing uh, efforts of everyone in Europe to cut down on, on use of gas, uh, cut back on energy, le- led to a, a spectacular uh, re- reversion in energy prices uh, in recent months. But even that still takes time to work through the economy. So uh, these are unusual episodes. Economics uh, works by looking at the past and saying, OK, based on past uh, patterns, how quickly would inflation come back to 2%? And essentially, the work of the ECB staff is to work out, given these very unusual factors, what is a reasonable timeline? And uh, what we have in our projections is... Uh, Inflation should come down quite a lot later this year, but getting all the way back to our 2% target, it's essentially scheduled more or less for 2025. But again, that assumes uh, also that uh, we deliver on our commitment. Uh, We deliver on our commitment in terms of making sure that interest rates will help that process. 
Okay, so we're dealing with a very unusual situation here, basically. Now, usually, policymakers look at what we call underlying inflation to understand how inflation will progress in the future. And indeed, Philip, back on our last podcast together in June, uh, we talked about how underlying inflation is all about trying to assess what will have a lasting impact on prices once the dust of any shocks, like the ones we've been seeing, settles. You essentially remove the volatile prices of things like energy and and food to get a better idea of price developments. Now, the ECB has just published a box as part of its economic bulletin that looks at how useful a measure underlying inflation is these days. And listeners, as always, you'll be able to find the link in the show notes. What's your view on this? Is underlying inflation still a useful measurement in today's rather atypical environment? So uh, I I think uh, the, the way you phrase it at the end uh, is is the critical issue. The concept of underlying inflation is permanently useful. We are always searching for, uh, as you say, when the dust settles. When the dust settles, what is the underlying pattern of inflation? Because that is really, from a monetary policy point of view, what we need uh, to bring back to two percent. Because of the pandemic, uh, because of bottlenecks, uh, the unusual surge in demand uh, in the last year, say, for example, for tourism, working out these measures is more difficult than normal. But again, that's where the work is. Uh, The measures do have to be modified, uh, that's for sure, uh, to take account of of this uh, very large change in energy prices. uh, And if you like the rotation in the pandemic, where initially People could not go out, but they could still order online uh, goods to their home. So home gym, uh, if you're working from home, uh, from a home office, new business equipment. Uh, whereas more recently, people are definitely uh, have returned to tourism, uh, entertainment and so on. So what I would say is conceptually, we're, we were very focused on underlying inflation, but it's more work than normal to work out where that is. So what I would say is, uh, we, we have uh, mixed messages. And, and this is fundamentally why monetary policy at the moment is tricky. In one direction, as we already talked about, the very rapid fall in energy prices, we are confident will bring down costs across the economy. Every sector uses energy, lower energy prices, and uh, easier supply chains now with the uh, bottlenecks over will push down inflation over time. On the other hand, what's happening this year is the high inflation we saw last year. I remember inflation was at 10% in the EU area last autumn. is basically pushing up wages this year. Uh, and so what we say is the domestic component of inflation uh, coming from, from rising uh, wages and also firms looking to, to rebuild uh, profits uh, is pushing up underlying inflation. So this force is working in opposite directions. uh, And this is why we're very data dependent. Uh, You know, as we go into the autumn, we're going to be uh, hunting for clues, looking at the incoming data, essentially to see which of these forces is uh, is getting stronger, which of these forces is getting weaker. Now, you mentioned uh, wages and profits there as two things that are affecting underlying inflation. I want to zoom in a little bit on those. What kind of things are pushing um, firms to put up their profits and what effect will that have on wages as well? And perhaps also, what, how do people perceive these prices? Um, at what point do they become unwilling to accept higher prices as well? What kind of considerations go into all that? So, so I, I think it's very interesting uh, and the ECB uh, in the last few years has, have, has developed if you like, uh, what's called a consumer expectation survey. So now uh, we have a multi-country survey every month and it's super interesting because uh, I I think uh, maybe a a dimension of inflation uh, that that, uh, we all need to think about is when do uh, people just accept it, saying, well, prices are going up because there's inflation in general versus prices are going up because this firm is trying to exploit me. Mm. And in our, in our recent survey, we exactly asked this question. And essentially, so far, 
uh, people understand that the dominant reason inflation went up so quickly was rising costs, especially energy costs. Next on their list was indeed profits and bottom of their list uh, was indeed uh, wages. And I think that, that was a, a kind of a good description of what happened uh, last year. But that, that is changing over time. So, so now the, the, from that kind of uh, cost structure point of view, uh, firms can no longer claim that energy prices are going up. Mm. But they can now say, well, that's uh, easing under the hand. My, my uh, pay bill is going up. My payroll is going up. Because people are asking for higher wages right, right. to recoup the cost. Uh, and that is true to some extent. But the other leg of uh, uh, profitability has basically basically been the level of demand. Now, Europe has not had a general uh, booming economy. But what is true is uh, at, a, at a, the level of, of a sector, for example, tourism. Uh, last year, uh, after, after the pandemic, there was a surge to book holidays. There was a surge to go out to restaurants. And at that point, there was still uh, supply was, was limited. Many hotels uh, closed down. Many airlines reduced the number of, uh, of planes that they flew. And so in that circumstance, with a big increase in demand, limited supply, firms were definitely tempted to raise prices quite a bit. And we saw that in rising profits. So this year, uh, we do think uh, demand is, is, is normalizing. It's not back to normal. Mm. People this summer, uh, as we speak, it's still a pretty strong uh, tourism summer in Europe. Mm. By the way, not just Europeans, but clearly a, a lot of people from uh, America, especially interested in taking a holiday in, in Europe. So we don't think that the profit uh, dynamic I I is over, but, but we are emphasizing this is something we need to see. Uh, we, uh, that, that not all of the wage increases can be passed on to consumers. Uh, and so our assessment that inflation will come down does uh, rely on a calculation that, that having had a, quite a lot of profitability last year, that this year and especially going into next year, uh, firms will just have to live with lower profits. Mm. And listeners will be sure to uh, put a link to that very interesting consumer expectations survey that Philip mentioned in the show notes. Now, a lot of the factors that we've talked about that are affecting inflation at the moment actually lie beyond the control of a central bank, things like energy prices and Russia's war in Ukraine. So my question is, what can monetary policy do in this environment, Philip? So the ECB has always been uh, crystal clear that basically our promise uh, uh, to Europe is that we will make sure inflation comes back to our 2% target in the medium term. So we don't promise that uh, every month inflation will be at 2% because, as you say, uh, major shocks can happen. Uh, the, the net effect of the pandemic uh, with the reopening phase was to drive up inflation. The net effect uh, of the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was to drive up inflation. And there were, there's been other global factors. And let me mention uh, something that's quite topical now it is also with, with the uh, very hot summer in Europe mm. and all the talk about El Nino this autumn. Uh, food prices are also being pushed up by, by, uh, by weather. So inflation can go up and it can go down for global factors. However, uh, what we cannot tolerate, and this is where the ECB comes into play, is we cannot sit uh, passively and accept that inflation will remain too high or too low. Uh, we have to act. Uh, and so it, it's, it's not about where the inflation came from. So, you know, in my assessment, uh, the inflation mostly came from the, the, the factors you listed. But it's the job of the uh, European Central Bank to make sure inflation doesn't stay high that it's guided back towards our 2% target in a timely manner. Well, before we wrap this topic up, we always ask our guests for a hot tip linked to what we've been discussing today so that our listeners can learn even more about it. Philip, do you have something to share? So 
the, the phrase a uh, hot tip on such a somber topic such as in inflation um uh, l- let me say uh, that I, I do have a have a, have a suggestion so here in frankfurt in the historical museum there's an exhibition about it it's called a, an exhibition about hyperinflation but in fact more generally it's a very interesting uh, and very visually uh, uh, a kind of a persuasive history of inflation going back many centuries and all the way to the present day. So for, for people here in Frankfurt or if you're planning a visit, this exhibition runs until the 10th of September. But maybe online you can also find some uh, resources at the Frankfurt Historical Museum. That's a great hot tip. I've been meaning to go and it's on my list of things to do over the summer. So thank you for that, Philip. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank ECB Chief Economist Philip Arlane for digging deeper into this really important subject for us. Listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB Podcast Summer School with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.